Greetings. Greetings from Taft Street Baptist Church. The title of this message is Jesus is the Only Way. And the text is John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. I'm going to go ahead and read the text and then we'll pray. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also, and you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Let's pray. Lord God, I just ask that you would just fill me with your spirit, your Holy Spirit, and that you would just empower me to teach these verses, Lord. Please, I pray, Lord, that you would give everybody who hears this understanding into your word. Give us all illumination, wisdom, guide us into all truth, Lord. And may it just provoke us to worship you, to worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, these things can only occur by your power, by your grace, and for your glory. We pray for all these things, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. John's main purpose for writing this gospel is stated in John chapter 20, verse 31. Once again, this is John chapter 20, verse 31, and it states this. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Christ's identity as God, the second person in the Holy Trinity who took on flesh, is set forth in this gospel, that people may trust him for salvation. The set of verses that we will be exploring today is contained within the Upper Room Discourse. The Upper Room Discourse is an extended address. It spans from chapter 13 in the Gospel of John, from chapter 13, verse 31, all the way to chapter 16, verse 33. It's an extended address with a concluding prayer. Soon after their time in the upper room, Jesus and his disciples, with the exception of Judas, who had already left, the journey to the Garden of Gethsemane. At Gethsemane, Jesus will be betrayed and arrested before his trial and his crucifixion. At this point, Jesus has departed from public ministry and is focused in on ministering to his disciples. He's, it's private ministry right now. He's preparing them. He knows that he will soon undergo um, great sufferings and he focuses in on the private ministry of preparing, challenging, and instructing and also comforting his disciples. Jesus knows they will be devastated. He knows they'll be confused when he's arrested, when he goes through the trial, when he goes through the crucifixion. And this is um, part of the means. He's, he's trying to prepare them for this. He's, he is preparing them for this. And so this forms part of the general context for the verses we'll, we will be exploring in this teaching. More specifically, the verses at hand follow after several things, including Christ's shocking revelation that one of the disciples will betray him. Along with this, Jesus tells them he'll be leaving them soon. And he also reveals that Simon Peter, who is really the main leader of the disciples, that he will deny him three times. These would have been very troubling, perplexing things for the disciples to hear. After these statements, Jesus comforts them with not only the verses we will be discussing, but also by promising after he is gone to send them another helper, that is the Holy Spirit. Let's go ahead into chapter 14, verse 1 in the Gospel of John. We'll read that verse again and we'll expound on the text. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In light of what Jesus had revealed to them about being betrayed, about being denied, and about the things he'd have to undergo, 
Do you think this might have been very comforting to them? And indeed, it must have been very comforting. And this is the, one of the reasons why Jesus said it to them. It would have served to diminish their fears and usher in some peace. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. When, are, when you are suffering, where do you go? <clears throat> Many seek comfort in the wrong places. Instead of doing this, go to the triune God. Believe in him. Trust in him. Have faith in him. He created us. He's the only one who truly knows us and can minister to us at a deep, deep level. When we turn to things other than God, we will not find true relief. We will not find true comfort. The created order is not capable of doing this. Only God can meet our deepest needs. Jesus is deeply troubled with the fact that Judas will betray him, chapter 13, verse 21, and Peter will deny him in chapter 13, verse 38, but even more so with the extreme sufferings he knows are forthcoming. The shadow of Gethsemane, his arrest, his trial, and crucifixion, they loom before him. Amazingly, despite the fact that Jesus is hours away from all these agonizing experiences, he ministers to his disciples. Rather than seeking to be ministered to, Jesus ministers to his disciples, even though he knows what's forthcoming. Let's read verses, chapter, uh, verses 2 through 3 in chapter 14. Verses 2 through 3. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Now, they are gathered in an upper room, which may have simply been an upstairs place or even on top of a rooftop. So all the disciples are in this one room and it must have been very crowded in there. It probably was somewhat crowded. And Jesus, which is in keeping with the way he, he tends to use what's around him to illustrate truths. And He's done that many times before, and I believe he's using his surroundings here to illustrate and express some truth. Soon the disciples will be without him, but Jesus comforts them with the fact that they will be with him forever, that their separation from him will only be for a season. Now, what is the illustration? Well, they're in this room, and it may have been crowded, and then he said, but he tells them there are many rooms in heaven rooms being prepared for them and the rest of the saints. And if these rooms are currently being prepared for them, he will, of course, take them again to himself. Jesus is the one who brings his saints home. Imagine the comfort that would have brought to them during this time, during this time they're going through. Now, does the word room bring up an image of a small and confining space? In my father's house are many rooms. No worries. In heaven... In the new heavens and the new earth, the, these rooms will be spacious, okay? It's not going to be like crowded or anything like that, but they'll be spacious and delightful. Is the thought of heaven comforting to you? The forthcoming reality of heaven is uplifting and encouraging. It helps us to undergo suffering. And one of the reasons why we need to set forth this doctrine is that it encourages us to persevere. Heaven encourages us to persevere. It helps us to understand the trials and circumstances that we're going through. It acts as a spur to incite us to carry on, to press forward, to be faithful to God. It's certainly easier to go through times of suffering and darkness when we know for certain, absolutely certain, that immeasurable joy, immeasurable comfort, immeasurable delight and pleasures await us. It is normal for Christians to experience trials, difficulties, and persecutions. Some experience more suffering than others. But take heart, God is with you. God is with you, and heaven will emerge right around the next bend. When you turn the corner, the flicker of a moment regarding your stay on this fallen world will dissolve before the immensity of a glorious eternity. And there you will see God face to face. 
You'll see him unveiled in all his glory, and you will not be consumed, but you'll be delighted. You will be amazed. And that's an encouraging thing. Let's go ahead to verses 4 through 6 in chapter 14. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. After Jesus tells his disciples that they know the way where he is going, Thomas the doubter says, <laughs> Thomas the doubter says, no, we don't know the way. What do you mean? Um, we don't know where you're going or the route. Thomas then asks him a question to underscore his previous assertion. Jesus responds to Thomas with a well-known and beloved statement. It's the sixth among the seven I am statements by Jesus contained in John's gospel. Can you list the other six uh, I am statements? The six other things Jesus called himself are as follows. The bread of life. That's in chapter 6, verse 35 and verse 48. Jesus called himself the light of the world. That's in chapter 8, verse 12, and also chapter 9, verse 5. The door of the sheep in chapter 10, verse 7 and 9. The good shepherd in chapter 10, verse 11 and 14. And the resurrection and the life, chapter 11, 25. And also the true vine in John chapter 15, verse 1. All of these I am statements refer, at least in part, to Jesus' saving relationship towards his people. These statements are also proclamations, whether explicitly or implicitly, of his deity, <clears throat> that he is God, the second person in the Holy Trinity. There are many ways, but there's only one way, a narrow way that leads to life. There are many roads, but only one leads to salvation to heaven where the Father is. Jesus is the truth. God is the author and revealer of the truth. He's the source of it. Jesus is the life. God is the author of physical and spiritual life. There is no other fountain of life. It is only from God the creator and sustainer of life. Only the triune God can impart eternal life. Jesus is truly the only way. Every other way or approach that claims to lead to God, to salvation, is a lie, leading to death, eternal condemnation. I know that's not popular, but it's God's word, and Jesus truly is the only way. Jesus made it clear, no one comes to the Father except through me. No one means no one. Nobody can go to the Father except through Jesus Christ. We need to set this forth before people. There's no, exceptions. There's no exceptions to this. Jesus is the only path to the Father. He's the door. Remember, there was only one entrance back into Eden. There wasn't several. And there's only one doorway in the side of the ark. Jesus is the only way. I'm going to read some verses in relation to this to support that. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. That was Acts chapter 4, verse 12. And in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 5 through 6, it states this. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. There is not many legitimate ways to God, only one. There's only one way to God the Father. Is this too narrow? Is this too unloving? If God declares there is only one way, who are we to say otherwise? God didn't have to make any way. After Adam and Eve fell, he could have consigned them and all of their descendants to an eternity in hell, and that would have been just. But in his mercy, in his kindness and love and grace, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, who lived the perfect life, 
in our place and died on the cross. There's only one way. And that's incredibly gracious. He did not have to do that. So God sent his son. Would it be loving a loving thing to do to tell people there are many ways to heaven when there is not? Is that a loving thing to do? It's not. It's unloving. True love warns of the false roads and directs people to the right road, to the bridge, the bridge of Jesus Christ, which spans the chasm beneath the bottomless abyss of darkness. Don't reject Jesus and his gospel. Repent from your sins and trust Christ before it is too late. When the gospel is preached, it's not an option given, but it's given as a command. We're to be obey that. It's a command to be obeyed. If I tell someone there's one sturdy, legitimate bridge across Damnation Gorge and all the other supposed bridges are illusions or corrupt and they cannot support a person, this is not unloving because it's exclusive, rigid and narrow, but it's loving. The wide path leads to eternal death, the narrow way to eternal life. The truth is always the most loving option. It can be difficult to express, and many may be offended by it and hate you for it, but we must seek to please God and point others to the only way by which they may enter into the kingdom. We do this by speaking the truth in love. There's not several bridges, there's only one bridge, and that's Jesus Christ. If people were, if people were to say, no, but this bridge is fine. I say, don't go on that bridge. That one's false. This is the right bridge. I know there's many bridges, but they're corrupt. And if you go on that bridge, you'll fall. You'll, it'll break through and you'll plunge down into the chasm. And what if they say, it looks fine to me. And anyways, a whole bunch of people said it's okay. So we're just going to go ahead on it. Don't go there. Don't do it. They say, well, I'm going to go down that way anyway. We need to warn them because the consequences are eternal. And if they reject Christ and reject the only way, the consequences are eternal. The ramifications are forever. There is only one way. There is only one true oasis in the desert. The others may look like pools, but they're waterless. They're dry. They're a mirage. There's a mirage, mirage here, mirage there, shimmering in the distance. It looks like water. It appears like water, but when you get there, it's just sand. It's just dry, hot, scorching sand. That can't slake your thirst, your eternal thirst. Only Jesus can. He is the oasis. Christ is the only way. He's the fountainhead from out of which true life, eternal life is given. Only he can give us true peace, comfort, joy, and life. I know that's not popular in our culture, in our society. But it is the truth. In order to understand that Jesus is the way, one must also recognize who he is, that he is God. And the Gospel of John reveals this in many places and also throughout Scripture. Here's some of the verses. John 1.1, 1, 1, John 5.18. John 10, 30 through 33, John 20, 28 through 29, Romans 9, 5, Colossians 2, 8 through 10, Titus 2, 13, 2 Peter 1, 1, 1 John 5, 20. Jesus is God, the second person in the Holy Trinity. One time a Jewish person said something like this to me, you're a Christian and I'm Jewish, but we worship the same God. <clears throat> now respectfully, I, is this true? It's not true. It's not true. What about Muslims or Mormons or the Jehovah's Witnesses? Do we all worship the same God? We do not. We do not. Why not? They all, in some form, deny Jesus' deity and the Trinity. The Jewish, Orthodox Jewish person says he's a mere man, a rabbi, and uh, they deny that he's the Messiah. And Muslims say he's a prophet. But they deny, um, as well, they deny that he is God. And Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses also deny that he's God. 
they may say nice things about Jesus, but they deny who he is. If you reject Jesus by denying who he truly is, you do not know God the Father. The only way to God the Father is through Christ the Son. If one does not know Jesus, that person simply does not know God. And if they think they do know him, they have been deceived. To know God the Son is to know God the Father, for he can only be known if the Son chooses to reveal him. That's in Matthew 11, 25 through 27 in John 1, 18. If one does not know the Son, one cannot know the Father or the Holy Spirit for that matter. Jesus is the only way. Once again, Jesus stated, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus stated that in John 14, 6. I'm going to read some more verses to support this. 1 John 5, 12 states, Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I'm going to read 1 John chapter 2, verse 21 through 25. And if you just hear me out on this, I know this is hard for some people. 1 John chapter 2, verses 21 through 25 states, I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, abides in you then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. Let me repeat verse 23. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Do you believe Jesus is who he said he is? Do you believe what God's word states about the Son? Have you recognized that you are a sinner and in need of saving? Do you realize there is nothing you can do to save yourself? Have you repented from your sins and placed your trust in Jesus Christ to the saving of your soul. Have you done this? If so, praise God. If not, why not pray now to receive Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior? It's, rec it's not just merely mouthing some words. It's recognizing that you are a sinner and turning from those sins and repenting from your sins and placing your trust in Christ alone to the salvation of your soul, putting your trust and faith in him. Some people think they're saved because they go to church or they just, they're religious, they've been baptized, maybe baptized. And baptism is a beautiful thing, but it doesn't save anyone. But it's a beautiful thing. Going to church is important, but that doesn't save anyone. We're all sinners. I'm a sinner. We're all sinners. And we're all in that same predicament, and we all need Jesus. And we can't save ourselves by trying to be good or trying to renovate ourselves or trying to do this or trying to do that. Jesus did it. He said, it is finished on that cross. He's the one who did it on your behalf. You need to accept that and trust him and repent from your sins. So if you've never done that, if you've never repented from your sins and you've never placed your trust in Christ, why not today? It says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. I, I would love to lead you in a prayer right now. It could be as simple as, as something like this. I'll pray it. And it's from the heart, though. It's not just merely repeating a prayer. And when someone's truly saved, they will bear forth good fruit. It could be, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Come into my heart. Save me. I know you're the only way. Save me from hell. Have mercy upon me. Amen. It could be as simple as that. 
but it's from the heart, recognizing where you stand and putting your trust in Christ to the saving of your soul. If you've never done that, please do so today and you'll have eternal life. And if someone's truly been saved, it'll reveal in a changed life. They will bear forth fruit that befits repentance. The fruit, the good fruit proves that the faith was genuine, that the salvation was genuine. It's only by grace we're saved through faith and it's not of any works lest we may boast about it before God. Amen and amen. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord God, I pray that, I pray for the salvation of anyone who's listening to this who has never, never put their trust, put their faith in Christ. I pray that they would truly see their state, their condition, and where they're at, and that they are sinners, and they're lost, and there's nothing they can do to save themselves. It's something that they have to trust Christ. Christ did it. I pray, Lord God, that they would truly repent from their sins, from the heart, and place their trust in Christ to the saving of their soul. Please save them. Please have mercy upon them. Oh, Lord God, we ask. We ask for their salvation, my Lord. Thank you, Father. We know, thank you for sending your Son who is truly the way and the life and no one comes on to you, Father, except through him. Thank you for sending your Son, Jesus. We pray for all these things, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, amen. <laughs>